this as a city highlight tour which means that we are going to be showing you um, some of the great spots and highlighted areas throughout our city. So luckily as you can see the, the mist is lifted so we've got an absolutely absolutely beautiful day. If you look towards the left you'll see Table Mountain in all its glory. So we're going to start off by taking a little bit of a drive just through some of the uh, special landmarks within the city past the Castle of Good Hope, Grand Parade, City Hall, Slave Lodge and then making our way up to uh, through Adley Street towards Bree Street uh, where you are going to be doing a morning coffee. I think a visit to Cape Town is not complete with uh, starting off at one of our amazing um, coffee houses that we do have. Uh, from there uh, we will probably continue by foot uh, to explore the city a little bit, uh, walking through the company gardens, um, past the Houses of Parliament, uh, making our way um, up to the Slave Lodge through St George's Mall towards Green Market Square. We'll give you, you guys a little bit of uh, a chance to have a look around and just explore some of the African market. And then by foot, uh, we will make our way up towards uh, the Boerkop area where you will enjoy a really, really uh, delicious traditional Cape Malay lunch. And then after that, we will be going up to some of the look lookout points uh, towards Table Mountain and Signal Hill just to get some pictures over the city, uh, making our way down towards Camps Bay, giving you some time on the beach, Maidens Cove lookout point, and then meandering our way around uh, back to the waterfront this afternoon, and then giving you guys some time to explore a little bit around there as well. So yeah, quite a full day, uh, but very relaxed. Um, this is really just to yeah, familiarize yourself and show you, you know, some of the hot spots that we do have to offer in the city. So if there's any questions along the way, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, yeah, so we should be in within the next, I'd say 15, yeah, 15 minutes or so. And then once we've meet, met up with the other students, we'll obviously continue later on. Okay.
So in 1652, when the Dutch arrived, they set up a refreshment station and eventually they actually established a trading route with India where they traded um, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables for spices. So they said that they've done the layout of the garden actually exactly how it used to be back in the day, just to try and um, preserve that um, authentic, you know, look that they had. So you can actually just take a little walk through and then we're just going to go by, uh, uh, through on the other side. Uh, they still use the garden for some community projects to plant some fruit and vegetables uh, that they then give to the, give to the commu community. So yeah, ongoing, ongoing project.
by 1670, this avenue was built and citrus trees were actually originally planted on both sides. Uh, so women carrying fruit baskets, collecting fruit that needed to be delivered, would be all doing this down uh, this way. If you go further up, more towards the mountain, there were these little causeways that had water running through, so the women would use that to wash their clothing, wash their dishes, or anything that they, that they needed to do. Um, so yeah, this was a very, very busy area for buskers, but also for the who's who, the richer people. It would be somewhere where you would be seen, you know, kind of strolling down here, um, maybe having a picnic somewhere. So if you were very upper class and high, this was kind of the place where you could come to be seen. Um, so yeah, just on the right here, we're going to walk past the Houses of Parliament. Um, as you guys know, in South Africa, we have different capitals that are responsible for different, uh, different things. Uh, so our president obviously does not reside over here in Cape Town. When the Dutch arrived in 1652, by 1685, 63,000 slaves had been imported from Indonesia, Malaysia, Morocco and other African countries. For 180 years, Cape Town was built on slavery. So once slavery was abolished in 1834, they had to work like a four-year apprentice service. So in 1838, the slaves were officially released and they moved from the slave lodge up to the area of the Burkhaf that then became known as the um, slave quarters but their new residence as well. So once the communities owned the homes which took a few years they actually started painting them the different colors to show that they were the ones now that were actually owning the properties. So you guys will see when we go up for lunch, really a lot of history, one of my favorite places to visit in the Burkhav. 80% um, of the community that live there are Muslims. So we have that very uh, big Cape Malay influence coming through, which is also something that's great about South Africa, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, I feel that everyone does really get along and we try and respect each other's cultures, especially in South Africa. If it wasn't for the Cape Malay community and the slaves, I almost feel like we wouldn't have a lot of what we do have you know, have today. So we try and preserve that and also we celebrate a Tweede Nibayar or Second New Year which was also started by the Cape Malay community and that is also just celebrating the day that they were actually freed as slaves. idea what this is behind you without reading yes <laughs> so this is a ori original segment of the Berlin Wall that was actually handed to Nelson Mandela I think 97 or something when he visited I have no idea how they got it here or how it was even um, yeah so a little piece of history Okay, everyone. So yeah, if you want, you can read a little bit more information for, about Green Market Square. So basically this market has been around for more than 300 years. So Green Market Square, needless to say, one of the oldest and one of the most popular market areas amongst tourists. Um, 
very important always, you know, for us to try and support the local community. You can buy the same sh uh, stuff in the shops in the waterfront. It's going to cost you the double the price and you're going to be supporting a, re a retailer. So very, very important for us to try and give back to the community and support the local artists. So I'm going to give you a few minutes just to have a little walk around. Uh, maybe the guys can just get some footage and then we're going to walk up to the Boerkarp for some pictures and a look and then have lunch. as your choice of preference for lunch today, but I'll tell you a little, little bit about the restaurant first. You probably are aware that we are the longest standing Malay restaurant. We've been around for over 44 years. The business has been in the family business for the last 42 years. My grandfather immigrated from India and he married a South African woman uh, or lady. And then he bought the building and then he rented out the building. For two years it was a restaurant first, a coffee shop and a butcher shop. After two years, the people that had the restaurant said, no, this is too much hard work. We're handing in our lease. 
My mother was a brilliant cook, so my grandfather approached just sneakily and said, instead of cooking for five, can you cook for 30 every day? Because the restaurant was only a 30-seater. She agreed and the rest is his friend. <laughs> we do have two types of cuisine. We are in the Malay quarters, but we are obviously from we Indian origin. So what we've done is we've been the blend the two fusion to the two fusions. I'll first start with the starters and then we'll carry on with the on your table, you've got a vegetable acha. This you obviously know is Indian accent. It comes from India. But we make our own. Everything you see on the table is made here on the premises. Onion and tomato sambal with a hint of chili. And then you've got a fresh beetroot salad. Your starters is potato wada. This is also strong from India. It's mashed potatoes, cumin seed, fresh coriander and some chili. But not burny. Not the burny chili. Then we've got the samosa. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Or zrupala. The three hooky face cookie. <laughs> and then I've got some chicken breast just dipped in some bread crumbs. Okay. On your table you've got a medley of juice. It's called the fruit punch. It's our brand. We make it on our premises ourselves as well. So bon appetit. Mm. After that we'll bring out the menu. Yummy. Thank you so much. On your table, you've got the basmati white rice. It got strands of saffron in, so that is why you see the yellow color. Mm -hmm. And it's got some braised brown onions on top. Okay. Next to that, you've got the chicken curry. But remember, that's a Malay chicken curry. Malay like to cook aromatic. Mm -hmm. They like to cook authentic. They like to cook natural. They do add spices very little, but the infusion comes with the tomato and the onion and the green pepper. Mm. So try that curry, it's completely different to an Indian curry. Mm. Then I've got a Penang, I'm not sure if you guys have ever eaten this. It's a sweet and sour beef. And this originates from, you know Cape Town was used as the halfway house to get into England. We were British rule before. Mm. And they stopped in Cape Town and obviously they needed to feed whoever was on board. Okay. So it actually originates from Malaysia, but it's now Cape Malay. But when they got here, the slaves got here, they had to use our ingredients to make something similar. So they had the beef, and then they've used some white vinegar and turmeric, which we obviously have in oh. Cape Town. And then we called it a Malay curry. So it's a Malay sweet and sour beef curry, Penang. Then I've got the yellow dal for all the vegetarian options. It's very plain, but it also has spices in all three of them are curries, but they've got different, you will taste these are complete different. This is a dal curry, but it's got very little spices in compared to that and compared to this. Okay, with that you'll eat your sambals on the side, your acha and your beetroot. Okay, enjoy. Thank you so Thank you. much. Amazing. Okay, so I'm sure you haven't dug into your dessert, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> your dessert, I said, I heard somebody mentioning it's a cook sister, not the cook sister. The cook sister, and you're absolutely right. There's quite a few different versions of the cook sister and the cook sister. Okay. I believe, and I'm not sure, I haven't actually gone into this, there's about 19 different versions. Oh but we'll just stick to our one that I know. If somebody asks me, please explain to me the cook sister, then I normally tell them it's a Malay donut with mm. some aniseed in, some nacho peel in, and a few other spices in there. 
what you're having in front of you can either be eaten as a dessert or otherwise we're very fond of having this for breakfast on a Sunday morning. Yes. So yes. either way, it's also one of the most popular Malay, Malay, uh, should I say, dessert or starter. Mm. Whether it's a wedding, whether it's a birth, whether it's a graduation, whether it's just the Ramadan, mm. a cool system must be on the table. Mm. Okay, so enjoy. Thank you so Thank you. much. <laughs>making our uh, way up to Signal Hill which is a very very famous uh, beautiful lookout point uh, which gives you lovely 360 degree views over the city as well as Table Mountain so if you look towards the left hand side there you will see Table Mountain in all its glory um, the first cable car actually went up into Table Mountain in 1929 so since then, 27 million visitors have been transported by cable car. In peak time, we can have up between 8 and 10,000 people per day that used to travel up Table Mountain. So it's 1,085 meters um, up to the top, so just over a kilometer. And then the stretch on the top is about two kilometers long. Um, in 2011, Table Mountain was also voted as one of the seven natural wonders of the world. So the first people to actually explore Table Mountain were the Kwekwe, or the sun, which were the gatherers and the herders. They actually lived on the foothills of Table Mountain. And it wasn't until Jan van Riebeek arrived uh, when in February, um, I think it was yeah, February um, in 1652, just as they arrived, Jan van Riebeek, along with 10 other people, were the first to actually climb to the top of Table Mountain and to signal to people below what sand parks would definitely not allow and appreciate today. They actually make, made a fire on the top of Table Mountain and that was the symbol that showed that they had reached the top. So even though the Khoi Sun never actually went up the mountain themselves, they named the mountain Hurikwaha, which meant mountain from the sea. And for many, many different reasons, including prisoners that lived on, Isle, on Robben Island, Table Mountain was always this very iconic beacon of hope, which they could see from far, far away. And it would just give them that, um, how can I say, um, What's the English word? Uh, like, like knowing that there was something to look forward to, there was something that they could see which they knew that they would eventually get out of here. So it was that little symbol of hope for them. Has anyone been, have you all been up Table Mountain? Most of you. Okay, those that haven't, on your birthday it's free. So then you can at least, yeah, um, save a little bit of money one way. Obviously alternative uh, ways to do it is to hike. You've got your natural easiest route kind of going from Platterclip Gorge and then you have Skeleton Gorge going from Kirstenbosch side which is obviously a little bit harder and then India Fenster uh, which one of our um, one of your colleagues actually has done a couple of times so you're really really something great to come and do along with Lion's Head which is just on our left hand side at the moment some very popular hikes and you can see why it's so loved by Capetonians, why we love being outside and enjoying our mother city because you have absolutely breathtaking views like we do over here right now. And you guys will notice, those of you that haven't lived in Cape Town all your life, it's a lot more relaxed. People are a little bit, you know, kind of go, go slow here. And that's one of the reasons why we call it the mother city is because it takes nine months for things to happen in Cape Town. Um, so yeah, the pace of life and I also just think the quality of life, you know, here is definitely appreciated and enjoyed a lot more.